Creek. All right. Good afternoon. I don't. I don't want to waste um, your guys' time since you guys are the the early birds and <laughs> listened to the the first mailer. Um, so we're going to get started, um, and we'll get everybody else, anybody else who walks in up to speed. Um, some of you know who I am already, um, I hope. Um, my name is Jessica Seymour. I work for Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council. We're a public agency. We're one of 10 planning, uh, regional planning uh, councils in the state. Uh, we only go where we're asked to go by municipalities. We only work for municipalities, and we get to be an extension of staff. Um, and so we're here um, at the request of the CRA, the city CRA, and the development department, um, who have been fantastic to work with and coordinate with. Um, our offices are located in Stewart, and I am a City of Stewart resident, so it's very exciting to work in my own city and just down the street, biking distance. Um, we were asked um, to take a look at the code for East Stewart and give it an update. Um, we've gone over some of those reasons why in the past, um, one of which being it's been a while, um, there's things that we do now that are, are better, better policies, better ways of expressing the same regulations or better regulations for how the built form can uh, come into play. Um, the other reason for updating the code is that we've got a lot of vacancies within East Stewart. We want to make sure that there aren't reasons within the code that are preventing people from building homes and businesses on those properties. Um, those are the, the two main reasons um, why we're looking at the code and why that this area has been looked at. Um, in order to kind of fact find those questions, those answers to those questions, we've been doing interviews. Um, so far we've conducted 33 individual interviews. We're still willing to do more of those. So if we haven't spoken yet and you, or you would like to speak again, uh, please take my card and we'll schedule something so that we can do an interview together um, and we can go over um, specifics about any businesses or owned parcels and questions about the process and the goals. We also conducted a vision update. Um, we had about 30 participants there. Um, and that uh, workshop was really focused on taking a look at what was the 2002 sh vision uh, from the Charette report that was completed and adopted uh, in that year. And we heard a lot of really good feedback from that. Um, and we'll, we'll be doing another presentation where we'll share some of that specific feedback, but it's all reflected into these code recommendations. Um, we heard that there were some elements of that um, vision uh, that were valid still, and there were some elements that are not so valid anymore, and they need to be refined in the code. Uh, there's some images. We also had our walking tour. We also had really good feedback um, from that process. Uh, we walked through the creek as well as East Stewart. Um, the two neighborhoods are very different in their goals and objectives, their makeups as far as whether or not there's an emphasis on residential or an emphasis on commercial. The creek is... Um, primarily commercial, and East Stewart is primarily residential. But it's still nice to see the two neighborhoods I, I, as a walking tour together um, because you, they're neighbors. They're, they're districts that are neighbors to each other, uh, a neighborhood and a district that are neighbor to each other, and they share the same watershed. Those are some images. This is where we are in the timeline. Um, so today is our work in progress presentation. Work in progress means we're not taking any action today. This is entirely for feedback to let you guys know um, what direction we're on and if we need to change ship or if we are full steam ahead or somewhere, you know, in between. Um, so we're not making any actions. This is for asking questions and feedback. Um, in order for this proposed code to be adopted, it would still need to go to the CRB for a presentation, the LPA, and two city uh, commission meetings. So um, we'll be presenting this information again and with additional detail at those presentations. 
Um, when you get a notification, um, and you will get a notification about the proposed code changes, um, it's always a little alarming to uh, have the government, you know, knocking on your door saying we're changing something, right? And you're talking about zoning and future land use and like, what do all these things mean? Um, so that brings about a couple of questions. Um, questions about property value, property taxes. Um, we've heard a lot of questions about the available funding for the improvement of existing homes and how does new la uh, land development regulations, how do new development regulations affect existing permits or existing homes? So I'm gonna go through some of those questions, although they you know, are kind of on the, uh, you know, the tangential to the code recommendations. Um, we got a, a really fantastic um, town hall that was hosted way back in November, I think. Um, where the property appraiser came in and they explained a little bit about property taxes, um, particularly for um, uh, single family homes. And so I wanna just kind of recap some of that information for everybody's benefit. This is a screenshot from a property in the city of Stewart. And I just wanted to kind of run through some of these numbers. So this is, this is information that's publicly available. You can pull this up on the property appraiser's uh, information on every parcel in the Martin County. So this fun fact. Um, and in it, it'll break down how much of the, the value comes from the land. That's pretty self-explanatory, right? That's, that's the land that you sit on. The improvement value, that's your buildings, your sheds, uh, your driveway, anything that you have improved upon the land. That's, that's where that comes upon. There's the market value, and this number, you know, is a rough estimate of what your appraisal value would be. This is what the, um, the market is predicting to a certain extent. Value knocks taxed. This is our save our homes benefit in this case. So we'll put a pin in that. Um, then you have your county exemptions listed. Um, there's a couple of ways to get a uh, homestead exemption. Uh, the most common way is that it's your primary home and you can have a, two homestead exemptions on that. Um, and so, and then this is the, over here, the county taxable value. And so all these numbers, right? This is your market value. This is your homestead exemption being taken out. Value not taxed. This is the save our homes benefit. And then that re results in this number right here, the county taxable value. And before I go on, let me clarify that I am not a tax professional. I don't work for the property appraiser, but this is just very general, publicly available information that's out there. Um, and I'm gonna do my best to run through it. Okay, so here is a trim notice. Everybody who owns a home gets, or is assessed property taxes, gets something like this. Again, this is publicly available information. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is that there's a lot of concern about if a new code is adopted, if um, roadway improvements are made, what is that gonna do to my property taxes? If my value of my home goes up, what's it gonna do to my property taxes? So this is a little example of how that rundown can occur. So each year, you know, the market value typically, not always, typically, it's been increasing. It's increased a whole lot, right, in the last couple of years. Um, so this home in particular had an increase of 17.8% in its market value. That value not taxed, that's the save our homes benefit. And you can see that that means that they, what that does is the day you, all right, I'm not gonna be able to explain this very well, but this is the 3% cap year over year that prevents year over year your property taxes going up 17.18% or your, your property value, your value, taxable value increasing 17.8% because it can only go up 3%, right? So year over year, it can only go up 3%. And year over year for this home, that has meant $75,000 $75, was not included in that um, assessed value. Then you also have the homestead exemption that's also cutting down on the um, market value and decreasing the amount that the county uses for the calculation for property taxes. 
Anybody still with me? Yeah. Okay. So, all right, what that means is in 2000, uh, this is for 2011, right? So this is 2020. This was the, the property taxes that were due. Um, in 2022, these are the property taxes that were due. Um, they were some proposed changes to the millage, which resulted in the property taxes. They did, in fact, increase, but only by, you know, four and change, not by this number, right? So I go through this example just to show that for single-family homes who are homesteaded, there are some protections that prevent, protect you from this kind of market value increase, right? And then this is another example from a different house, but it's the same story again. This one, they have two homestead exemptions, though. So this is something that, again, it's, and that made a huge difference, right? In fact, without the millage increase, their taxes actually went down, you know, the, potentially. You know, they only had the 1.8% increase. So the more homestead exemptions, the better off. So it's always really important to be sure that you're, you know, signed up for every single homestead exemption that you um, can qualify for. So there's, again, I'm not a tax professional. These are, you know, pro publicly available numbers, but I just wanted to kind of run through how that market value is disconnected from the, um, not, yes, exactly, the, the, the overall tax bill. There's more things at play than just your property value. Um, all right, and addressing the question about um, existing homes in need of improvement. There's nothing more affordable than the home you already own, that you already live in. We want to help people um, maintain those homes, bring them up to code, make the life of that home extended. Um, this is a quick rundown of some of the programs that are out there and have been out there. Um, SHIP, unfortunately, right now, their wait list is closed, um, but that's always something to check back on. Um, the City of Stewart CRA has, a, has programs as well. They have the Community Block Grant. That deadline was in April 28th. Um, and then Pinal, of course, will be able your, to be your point person on these programs. The resi Residential Facade Improvement Grant Program, that's the Paint Up Program, um, and that has a lot of components to it. Um, and then the Brush with Kindness Program with Habitat for Humanity in the City of Stewart, that's not just for paint. So um, just please make sure that those resources are available to you and, and reach out if you want to, um, if you think you can qualify and, and go through those uh, programs. Existing homes and businesses. So when a, when a code is adopted, um, the question then comes, well, I have an existing home. What does that mean for my home? Um, if you have an existing home, and let's say, you know, there's a um, existing setback, you know, your existing setback on, on many of the homes in, in, Stewart, in East Stewart are 20 feet. Um, and in the proposed code, we're actually proposing a build two zone of 20, 20 feet, it's actually 50, 10 to 20 feet. So you would still comply with that existing, the new standard. Um, but let's say your house was a little bit further back for some, some reason, it was 25 feet. Is the city going to require you to relocate that house five feet? Absolutely not, that would be ridiculous. So what that means is if for some reason that home is demolished or removed, um, or you were doing a substantial improvement on it, let's say like an addition in the front, then they would be required to meet those standards of the new code. So I don't, you know, anything that's existing, that remains um, as it is, you're, you're on the, the books of that uh, capacity. If you re rebuild or, you know, um, do a very substantial renovation, there may be some requirements to do some incremental improvements to keep it in line with the code. Um, that said, we've also been very careful to take a look at what's the existing fabric and make sure that the development standards that we're proposing are in line with existing fabric. Because the whole point of this process is to respect the existing fabric, um, the existing context and the existing buildings and help promote um, a filled out neighborhood um, that is complementary to what's already on the um, parcels today. 
if you have an active, going back to that, if you have an active application, you've already you know, submitted for your front porch addition or a new driveway or you know, whatever that is, and you've got that application in today, then, and you want to stay the course with your proposed work, that is still a valid um, uh, process. You, you don't need to, this doesn't apply to you and that, that application or that proposal. Um, this was all, will only be effective once uh, the code is adopted. And again, we're looking at sometime in um, the late fall for that. Okay, so now we're going to do a little time lapse, and I'm going to try my best to do some planning history in the city of Stewart. Um, so right here, this is a 1956 aerial of East Stewart, and that's a rough circle for the location, right? Um, to give you some, ooh, some bearings, right? This is the Stewart Training School where this, this arrow is pointing. The red lines right here indicating the ways in and out of East Stewart. Um, you can see that what, we, what will become MLK is not a uh, finished road. It's not continuous. Uh, 10th Street runs this way, right? And this is the crossing at Florida. This is the crossing at today's MLK. Okay. In 2004, um, there was a code update, and there was a specific East Stewart uh, code that became effective. Um, and the zoning districts that are highlighted in yellow are what were adopted. This is the uh, business mixed use district in pink. This aqua kind of blue or seafoam blue here is the East Stewart General Residential Office. And then there was a single family duplex pocket in the middle, okay? So this is our study area for East Stewart. Um, this is the, you know, historically the East Stewart uh, pocket here, but we also captured some of these other parcels as part of our study area and we'll, we'll go over that again. So when this code was adopted in 2004, one of the pieces of the vision was respecting what had historically been a mixed-use neighborhood. There were commercial businesses, there were residential, there was um, some multifamily within East Stewart. Now, what we've learned in our, in our analysis since this 2004 code update is that some of those requirements were a little too onerous and maybe put too much emphasis on the commercial aspect. But this was an, in, well in, this was an intended effort to capture some of that vision of what was in the historic fabric for East Stewart. Um, so to that point, when we, our, propo our proposed code, what we're looking at really carefully is making sure that East Stewart is a neighborhood code, okay? It is not a district code. A district is focused more on commercial uses. A neighborhood code is focused more on creating a neighborhood fabric. And when I say fabric, I'm talking about the way the buildings look and the form of the building, how they meet the street, um, and then in addition to that, the kinds of uses that are inside there too. Um, part of this code update too is to try to look at how we can simplify the East Stewart code so that as many standards that will apply to most people when they go for a development proposal are all housed in one place. Now there are gonna be some chance types, times where we're gonna reference chapter two and chapter five, which have some very specific standards. But when we talk about chapter six, we're gonna try to pull in as many of these standards like stormwater management, landscaping, commercial development, and bring those into East Stewart so that there's a simplified one shot stop for what is required for development. Um, okay, so the it's hard to propose changes when you don't know what the existing code is. So we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about the existing code and then bouncing back to what we're proposing, okay? So today, this is not the proposal, this is what's on the books today. Um, the East Stewart Business Mixed Use District is what's highlighted here. Whoop. Highlighted here in pink. Today, that allows for commercial, including retail, restaurants, and offices. 
and it allows for multifamily residential if in conjunction with commercial uses. So what this was promoting or, or anticipating or hoping is that you would have vertically integrated businesses, right? So you'd have a shop on the bottom and a flat on top. That's a great vision. Um, but unfortunately, that's proven a lot harder for developers to build. And it may not be responsive to what the market wants or some aspects what the community wanted. So what we're recommending, and this is the proposed uh, map along with the proposed uses. Um, we are proposing to maintain the commercial uh, uses, like retail, restaurants, and offices, but making sure that we have sensible restrictions for um, how those are developed so that they can be good neighbors to their, their single family residential. We're also recommending the removal of the con in conjunction with commercial uses because, again, these are a lot of this area in pink. There's several of these are vacant lots. And if there's something that we need in the community and citywide and definitely in East Stewart's neighborhood is more housing. And this is a housing focused neighborhood. So we need to permit multifamily housing and duplexes and single family dwellings. So we're adding, we're proposing to add duplexes and single family dwellings as a permitted use inside that pink area. Any questions? Before I go on? Okay. All right, so then the next district that's East Stewart specific is the East Stewart General Residential Office. So again, this is what's permitted today. This is not what we're proposing. This is. Tomorrow, you could put in development applications for these uses. Low impact commercial, including offices. So this is primarily allows for uh, professional offices and medical offices. Um, if you had a paralegal's office or a law office, those kinds of uses. Those would be, those are considered low impact because you, they don't have a lot of smells, they don't have a lot of noise, they have very regular hours very few patrons coming in and out. So it's important to think about when we talk about commercial uses, they don't all have the same intensity, right? Um, a restaurant has a lot more people coming in and out, a lot more noises. Um, so this is a low impact um, commercial uses being permitted in this green area. Yeah, sorry, to, so right here, this is east, this is central, right? This is Tarpon running down. This is Church Street. Answer that question. I cannot answer that question. I really wish you could. I could. Right. 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 So, so at Church Street here, there is something that changes. Right. Exactly. So, so one on this side, this is just single family residential, right, or single family and duplex, and then on this side. You are allowed to do single family and duplexes and multifamily on this green, on tarpon, all the way down. Exactly, and and that's permitted. That's in a permitted use. What's it? 
No, no, this is not proposed. This is today. This is what's on the books today. Right. I, no, I understand. I appreciate it because this is really important and it's, it's really heady stuff because it's hard to, um, you know, what, what are we talking about when we talk about little colors on a map? You know what I mean? You, you, guys, you have the context of your actual neighborhood and what's on the street, you know? Um, oops. So these, these properties right now, so let's say, you know, you have churches right here and then they're, yep. Right. So let's say one of these properties right here today, Today, if somebody wanted to open up a uh, paralegal and notary's office inside one of the, what today might have been a single family home, they are permitted to do that mm -hmm. today. So that's just a little, little quiet office, right? Not, we're not talking about a heavy commercial use. Well, so why would you put that in the residential? Because it's quite sophisticated. Right. I mean, there are a lot of places where these, those uses can live next door to each other yeah. in a lot of harmony. Okay, all right. So one of the things that we want to be careful about, and now I don't know if this, this would have to work very closely with, um, with legal on this. When you have a permitted use, you have to be very careful that we're not taking away somebody's investment-backed expectations, is what it's called, right? So let's say somebody brought that property and they wanted to put um, their architecture office there. I don't know, you know, something like that. That's something that is permitted today. So if there was somebody who had that investment-backed um, uh, expectation, and they meet that standard, we need to be careful that that's not something we take away. So a store would not be permitted. A store would not be permitted. So a, a corner store or a, um, a cafe, a bagel shop, a, you know, those are restaurants. Those are higher impact commercial uses, right? That's not permitted. Right. Again, it's very limited, the number of businesses. Like daycares. Daycares are a business, right? We've got a couple of daycares in the neighborhood. Those are important aspects of the neighborhood. So we got to make sure that, you know, that those, those businesses, you know, they have an investment-backed expectation that they are a part of the neighborhood, right? That, that's an example of a business, though, um, that may or may not be allowed in some residential districts. So I just, you know, I want to be careful with what we're talking about commercial. There are levels to commercial activity, right? So stores, no, not permitted in this green. Um, bars, not permitted. Um, let's see, what, what other kind of businesses would you, would you find that would not be permitted? Uh, today, this is today. Could you do a cigar shop? Could not do a cigar shop. No, no retail. No what retail. What about a salon? No salon. No so a real life practical example is the corner of Tint and Carpon, the house there um, that the church owns. Uh, Pastor Polk wanted to put uh, like a smaller JoJo's in there, and he, he couldn't do it because it wasn't zoned for that impact of the commercial development. <laughs> But you could do a cottage industry like a seamstress or something yeah. like you said, a notary public. So there, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I got excited. Um, so yes, there's another level of how businesses can interact with a residential district. And this is not just in East Stewart. This is everywhere. And there's actually some state legislation that, that provides some protection for a home occupations. So... You know, that's a different situation. So you're, you're uh, a beauty salon, for example. If you have a very small scale and you're working as a, as a home occupation, you know, you may be able to fall under that umbrella. But if you've got, you know, a certain volume of chairs, then that wouldn't necessarily be permitted. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just list off for you. So then so there's a lot of hey, questions Jesse. about this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so that's what I was just going to go through the list. So why don't I list what today is permitted? Okay. 
So this is specifically in this area that we're talking about that's, that's green, right? So what's permitted today? Single family homes, detached dwellings, duplex dwellings, multifamily dwellings, uh, family daycares, group uh, home occupations, right? Rooming and boarding houses, bed and breakfast, an adult daycare through conditional use, a child, uh, child care centers, community centers, government buildings, libraries, museums, no, not museums, I'm sorry, nursing homes, religious institutions, a massage therapy establishment, an office for business or professional use, an office for medical or veterinary use, and we are proposing, there's a question as to whether or not we would want to propose um, studios, and that would include art, dance, or exercise studios. So that's what, when we talk about a limited list of commercial activities, right? That's, that's the limited list that applies today in this area. So today those things can exist. Those things exist today, exactly. And we haven't, on, on tarpon, but not all the way on tarpon. See, so there, there's, see this little block right here? This is yellow. We haven't gotten there yet. That's just the yellow here is single family duplex. Oh, it doesn't look like yellow Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that one next one because we're, it's not highlighted because we're not there yet. <laughs> okay. No, no, thank you for the question because that's an important clarification. Um, all right, so now that we all kind of have a clear understanding of what's existing today, yeah? We're gonna go, oh, okay. So I'm not doing it. No, not you. <laughs> Today, the, it stopped here. And it may reflect back to some of the, the community input about a change at Church Street. That, that may have been, unfortunately, some of that detail has been lost to time. And I can't tell you why that was done that way. It may have been because this side of the road, right here on Tarpon, said, no way, Jose, keep it single family. Whereas this side of the road said, no, we actually want to have those permitted uses on this side. So, right? I mean, yes. I guess um, for Tarpon, you're saying from MLK to Fifth Street is what can happen now. Exactly. And somewhere between 202 and 206, the changes were made. Right. Absolutely. Um, the the only caveat to that is that we have to be very careful of any existing uses out there today. People who own businesses today, who who don't who have, have that, you know, there might be somebody who has a you know a, um, massage therapy or or. Um, Gen <laughs> right, and, and that's, you know, if there's no businesses and never have been over there, you know, again, th that's all the more reason why we should explore that then. If, so when we're going to go to the next slide, the next slide is the proposed, okay? All right, so it's a little different. I, we're keeping some of that, but in this drawing here, based off of this feedback, we're gonna go back and reanalyze, particularly south of Church Street is what I'm hearing. You know, there was never any expectation. Um, so we'll take a look at, at what's, what's there and what are the uh, investment-backed expectations. You know, that's, that's a level of analysis where we really do have to talk to as many of those people, individuals, and be sure, because uh, we don't wanna get the city into a lawsuit. So. Are we are a little bit <laughs> Yeah. People that showed up and that input dictated. Right. Not, right. Not, not somebody else from here, what they want to see. But the people that he stood dictated the, the present situation as it's shown now. What they want, it was the people's input, not one individual or nobody like that. That's why I'm surprised where this comes from. I don't know. I'm surprised to me. I want to know 
Right. Well, and, that, and that's why we're doing this. If there's, if there's an expectation that hasn't been communicated properly and what was adopted, you know, this is an opportunity to take a look at that. Um, so we'll, we'll go back to the drawing board. We'll take another look at this. We'll see what, how much of those spaces need to maybe consider that transition um, to the next district. Okay, so inside this district, though, we are not promote anywhere where the GRO is, right? This is not, we were not anticipating to change any of the permitted uses in that area. But again, we'll take another look at this specific uh, district here, um, or zoning category. The next one, again, existing. So we're going back to what was adopted in 2006, 2004, um, is the single family duplex area. And so that's in here. Hopefully this looks a little bit like it's yellow, outlined in black. And then there's one little pocket of it as well up in this area on uh, MLK. So again, this is talking among, this is half of the street on Tarpon, Nassau, <laughs> Um, this is Bayou? No, no, this is Bayou. Uh, I don't know. I lost the street name there. Spruce, Bahama. Spruce, thank you. Okay. Proposed, when we talk about this area, no changes, right? And then we'll come back and we'll talk about these, these little pieces in just a minute. But no changes. It's going to continue. We, we're recommending that it continue to be single family duplex. No changes. OK. Again, um, going back to what's on the books today, what was adopted between 2004 and 2006, um, is the existing, what's on the books as the existing code today. These are the remaining um, zoning categories in and near East Stewart. Um, what we're recommending, because these are such important entrances and gateway moments into East Stewart, that they become um, part of the East Stewart neighborhood uh, code. And I'm gonna go through some of those reasons. One, and this is the a really important one, um, when you do planning, when you're doing good planning, you wanna have like facing like, uh, you wanna have front facing front. This honestly goes back to the example that you've already brought up about what happens on Tarpon but south of Church Street especially, because you don't have like facing like there. Um, same is true of what's happening on MLK um, in particular and through a portion of 10th Street. The reason why that can be an issue is you can end up with the back of buildings facing the front of buildings. And you know, you have uh, the back of buildings, you end up with you know, back of building activity or uh, like garbage and dumpsters and parking. And really, we need to have a nice front door on both sides of the street. It's best when the back can face the back, right? And the front can face the front. Um, I describe it the same way as having a dialogue between people, right? You want to talk face to face. You don't want to talk to somebody's back. So when we take a look at these parcels, again, this is what's on the books today here, here, and along here. Um, this is an opportunity to bring them into the fold of the East Stewart Neighborhood Code. Um, whoop. All right, that looks weird. Um, and rezone them into what would be like face like. So more of the single family duplex, which is consistent with what's there today in R1, and allowing these parcels to come in as the GRO, which allows for single family dwellings, duplexes, and multifamily. There you go, that looks better. So this would be the overall proposed zoning map for East Stewart. Um, again, I understand that they just look like a lot of colored blocks, but I hope that you can start to start to see how they develop a fabric to the neighborhood. Um, and then we'll go ahead and we will definitely take another look at especially these green areas and what's permitted there and how they can be uh, maybe better suited to the neighborhood. Now, question on that point, actually. So this, the GRO, there was a lot of t conversation about the commercial. What about um, multifamily, like a four-plex walk-up? I mean, that's something, too, that 
you know, just to step back a little bit, when we talk about um, residential and commercial in that area, so these, these green areas, they are the area where you're permitted to do um, more than two dwelling units. So it's just something to, to think about. All right, I'm gonna go through the streets. Yeah, so Tarpon, right here, right? Both sides of 10th Street, you've got a little bit of that fabric today on 10th Street. You have um, a little bit on Spruce, but these are the uh, Housing Authority properties, right? Uh, a little bit to the north of um, Bahama and through most of Bayou right here, okay? Um, it's also um, along the back of Central Avenue and the end of Church Street here. Right? And then everything at the end of, of 10th Street. Yes? You just mentioned tenants, which is my area. Yes. Now, there was a time that the houses were seen to be built there, and it wasn't allowed to be right. built. So we're going to. Well, it was, it's not just because it was commercial. What it was is that it prohibited multifamily or single family homes. And what we are recommending is that we remove that so that it allows for single family homes, duplexes, and multifamily. So yeah. Again, we're, that, that's going back in the time machine, and I can't go back to 2004 and, and undo that, you know, or redo that. What we can do is now we can fix it. Right. My point is, like everybody said, things being done, that, you really don't go nothing at all. It's right. not fair for us. Right. No, absolutely. And I, I, I'm, I'm here. Right. 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 Right, and, and, I, and we want the city, the CRA, the development department, we want today, in 2022, I don't know what year it is anymore, um, we want to fix that. And right? Jessica, can I just chime in real fast? So back, what happened with Terry O'Neill was the development director at the time. Jim Christie had created a Stewart Main Street program, and they were quest and meeting with people in the East Stewart area, and there was a push, because when the overlay zones were done, they wanted businesses and things to return to East Stewart the way it had been in the the, the golden days, and they weren't, businesses weren't knocking down the doors, so they went back to tweak that, and they did it as recently as 2010 as well. When the area that we're talking about, what happened was there was a push to want to be able to have commercial uses on it, but there was also a community-wide restriction saying, well, we wanted to include housing as well, so when they said the mixed use, what they said is, it has to be mixed use. Right. So it, it, it kind of got lost in the interpretation. And instead of saying it can be just residential, or if it has a commercial component, it has to have a residential component with it, right. it got drafted and adopted as just mixed use. And that's where the, the right. transition lost. And, and what, is, what has happened too, I mean, you know, if some, and we don't want to take that away from anybody either. If somebody wants to do a mixed use project with commercial and resi residential in those areas, we're, we're recommending that that continue to be allowed. It was just allowed. a report. But we also know that there's historic fabric that is single family homes, that there were times when there were single family homes and small homes on those lots, and that would also be consistent with uh, the community vision and, and what we've heard from the outreach that we've been start we know since November, right? And part of the, part of that charrette information happened is that that Stuart Main Street came forward and they started promoting the charrette and they had a charrette, but the charrette was a visionary meeting. Right. It, they did not write any code. They did not write any zoning. Nothing. And that charrette was a, was adopted as a as a report. But nothing was actually adopted and put into the code, or there was no overlays or no zoning done from it. So some people perceive that because the charrette said we'd like to see a swimming pool or a gymnasium, that when the commission accepted the report, that it somehow had programmed the building of the gymnasium, but, it, but that never happened. I mean, it is a, it's a document that, that, if you don't mind, I'll just add a little bit. It, it's a document that communicates the vision. And you're right, it, it's an extensive 
uh, community outreach effort. And, but it doesn't adopt any land development regulations. And when you go to d adopt those land development regulations, it's a different, it's, it's a, they go back, you yeah. should, good process goes back to that charrette document and interprets those visuals and those guidelines and those pieces. They also go through an extensive process of talking to the property owners and, and making sure that everything is done in a way that's legal. So, you know, again, we have that as a foundation, but we've learned, and, and also what I wanted to add to what was um, said is that, you know, back in the early 2000s, there was a lot of hope and excitement about it, vertically integrated mixed use or mixed use projects. And it turns out that those things are a lot harder to finance oh, yeah. through, um, and there weren't a lot of developers who were very apt at doing that yet. It was you know, reinventing what had historically been done in downtowns all across America. And it's, <laughs> it's like everybody forgot how to do it, right? Um, and then also market demands are different. There's not as much we're over-retailed as it is, so we don't necessarily need all that commercial space in East Stewart today because the market is a little different. Um, so those are some things and, and some explanation as to why those that vision didn't get built out. Um, and to your point, Mr. Brinkley, you know, we don't want that you know, for Habitat or someone else to knock on the door of some of these properties in the future and not be able to build a home because that's also consistent with what we want in, and what we've heard is needed and part of the vision for East Stewart. Also, yes. Also doing that, oh, go ahead. East Stewart does have East Stewart This is the East Stewart River, okay. Urban Code. That, but that's that's what this is. That's that's what this is. That's what I'm working from. You can go online. You can go to Muni Code and and check all my work. <laughs> you know. And if I made a mistake, please let me know. This is the East Stewart Urban Code. That's what we're looking at. And and that's where these existing. The, the, when I talk about the existing today, permitted uses. That's what I'm looking at. That's what was the East <laughs> Stewart Urban Code. But so, Ms. Jessica. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the point of what we're trying to do now is to take input from the community, listen to the proposed changes. We cannot change the past. She's talking about what the code is now and what Jessica is going through. And what we're trying to do is to listen, take the feedback of what the community wants. If something was done incorrectly, say, in the past, you know, a decade and a half ago, we want to listen to that from what the community is saying and have it brought all the way up to the commission level. And I'm going to be careful with my words, but and then at that time, the commission will weigh what is proposed, hearing from the community, hearing from Jessica and the Regional Planning Council's proposals and, and weigh to codify that to adjust the code. So that's this right here, this, and hopefully future meetings are the, that process so we can make it right going forward. Thank you. Mayor, can I say something? I know that this is advertised for the public to, for you to give your report, and it's not a commission meeting for us, so I also have to be careful with my, my words. But I just wanted to, you know, we've been working, and Pinal has been working on this, and People have been saying, you know, let's get something, let's get some vibrancy going in East Stewart, and then we come back to write what Mr. Bell is talking about, is that we have the urban code, we tried to change it, that didn't get changed to help accommodate some things, and sometimes when things don't get codified specifically, and people, we have a meeting, and people have a vision and an idea, and I just believe if it's the last day before I die, and I know that the people who work on these things in all these committees, I believe they feel the same way. We want to get things solidified. We want to know what's there, what's underneath what, who has changed what, what's for the benefit of the community, what's not for the benefit of the community. And that's why we're going through this exercise and just trying to, to get things done so that you know, everybody hopefully will have a good understanding and when somebody wants to develop something that, you know, the, all these roadblocks aren't there and, 
and people understand what the history is. And I do agree with Mr. Bell that um, during the time I think Mr. Christie was here, I think Mr. Mr. Mortel did a good um, summary because he was here on the commission too at the time. But um, we just need to all recognize that some of those things might have been tweaked by staff and by what was presented to the commission at the time. That thing that you're showing there, Mr. Harvey has the phone book, has 80 or more businesses that were there. Some of that was because of segregation and so on. But that still doesn't stop that area from having a jazz club or business or other things coming into the area as long as it's in the right location, which is what people were concerned about when we had one of our meetings at the very beginning about, you know, when we're talking about the form-based code and all these different things, and just to let it come to light. I, Jessica, I think you're doing a good job just trying to bring it little by little, and um, I'm just so glad that we're trying to get to the bottom of things, get to the root of it. Thank you. I, I brought this up again just to show that, you know, again, when the, those code changes happened in, in 2004 based off of the charrette, and again, maybe they're not perfect and no code is perfect, you know, it, it was done with the best of intentions and to, to recapture some of that um, activity that had once been part of East Stewart. It was not, you know, that I think there was a lot of well-intended policies and, and but again it's been 20 years since that happened so it's time to update uh, yes Helen so you're talking about Taylor property yeah, we today that yeah so inside I'm gonna read it from the list again just so that we can be really clear and I'm gonna be a little faster this time okay so Offices, medical and professional, massage therapy establishments, schools, religious institutions, nursing homes, libraries, government buildings, community centers, child care center, adult day care center on conditional use, uh, bed and breakfast, rooming boards, home occupations, family day care, multifamily dwellings, duplex dwellings, detached dwelling ancillary to a single family dwelling unit and a single family dwelling unit. That's what's permitted today and that's what we're proposing as the, and maintaining going forward. Right. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. And I mean, frankly, the market wants to build housing. So Again, there's nothing, you know, right now in, in the, that's permitted today, we want to keep that. The, um, that's why I brought up one of the things about transitioning this green to say the yellow would be then you would be limiting the amount or the types of residential possibly. And we don't want to close the door to more housing options. So we want to keep that door open. Um, but we'll take a look at some of those other uses that we just listed and, and where they may be appropriate, or maybe there's some uses that don't have any investment-backed um, expectations, and we can take a look at those. So that, that's something I just to add for the green area. Yes. Okay, okay. Oh, Bahama Breeze, the yellow buildings. Well, yeah, I have some architectural comments about that. So we'll actually, we'll put a, a pin in that. Okay, so part of the code is we're taking a very detailed look. Yes. So which which intersection? This one. So that's that's central and lake. Those are the existing. Cold, cold right 
Yeah, so those are, that's the existing boundary in this area for the pink. We're not proposing any changes, but what we want to add are the ability to build single family homes, and we want to add the ability to do multifamily that is not tied to commercial. So you could do a fourplex or uh, you know a cottage court of you know small dwelling units on a single lot. Right. Is that going to take, um, more units? Yeah. No, so, so in the pink, this is your, your highest intensity commercial inside uh, the business mixed use area. Okay, so let me go. If we want it, do we need to run through it? Do you want to run through it? Yeah. All right, good. Okay, so, and this is where, again, we're looking at the existing uses, right? So right now there is studios, art, dance, music, exercise, uh, retail, restaurants, office, medical and business, microbreweries and distilleries, massage therapy establishments, catering shops, bars, barber shops, uh, beauty salons, banks, art galleries, schools, religious institutions, nursing homes, museums, libraries, government buildings. We want to add funeral homes without crema uh, crematoriums, that um, existing business actually isn't listed in the, the uses, so we're gonna add, we, we're proposing adding that as a conditional use. Community centers, child care centers, adult day care centers as a conditional use. Um, rooming and boarding houses, hotel and motels, um, multifamily dwellings in conjunction with commercial, and this is where we wanna change things. We wanna add home occupations, uh, the duplex dwellings, and the single family dwellings. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've got some more material to go through. Again, take my card if you wanna talk about this some more and we'll come back to it. And we're also not done yet. So we're gonna come back with some further recommendations on that map where we can make some changes. Um, as far as our process goes, we are doing a lot. Um, we took these size lots in particular, uh, 36 by 100, uh, 50 by 100, and 50 by 120. So these are typical lot sizes. And what we do, um, this is one, this is the uh, 50 by 120. And we are testing out what fits on the site. You know, today this is a vacant site, so what would fit? You've got some existing built out on street parking, some existing <coughs> sidewalk. What happens if you put in a two story structure um, and the required parking? So this is, you know, an example, just a test study for what could fit on the site, how it can lay out. Um, you know, this could be, again, that vertically integrated apartment where you've got lofts on top, commercial on the bottom, or it could be a unit that is entirely multifamily. Um, so this is just a concept. Um, and then we also took a look at, well, what happens if you build out an alley on these commercial lots where there's some opportunities to possibly do that? And what you gain when you do that, um, you get a lot more green space, uh, and you get the sidewalk to be a little bit cleaner. So again, this is just some food for thought for how we're testing the sites. Um, the development standards, so what we did here on these uh, development standards, these are the existing development standards. Again, what's on the books today, not what, not what we're working on. What we're, what's allowed today in most of the, again, we put those colors in here so you can kind of easily identify which areas on those maps we were just talking about. So we're maintaining that now there's no minimum uh, lot area or lot width. We're maintaining that. That's an important feature in East Stewart. That was an important feature of the urban code because it allowed for uh, folks to be able to build on the small lots. The lots are uh, platted pretty small on some of the um, area and that's honestly a fantastic thing for a walkable down neighborhood. Um, so we want to maintain that. The other um, changes here are in yellow. These are about building placement. And we modified these so that you have five foot setbacks consistent in the neighborhood. Um, and then a rear setback of 10 feet. Um, before, there was a rear setback of about 20 feet, which is really large for small lots. 
Um, so this could have, this allows for more buildable area on the site while still maintaining cottage uh, type buildings. Um, and then these are largely driven by the uh, desire to be able to allow for accessory dwelling units. So accessory dwelling units are a small unit that can be added to a primary structure. This can be uh, where you have a rental property. It's another avenue for affordable housing. It could be uh, used for multi-generational living. So this is something that um, Right now, the existing setbacks were quite onerous, so they wouldn't really allow for that space very easily. So we want to go ahead and capture some setbacks that would allow for that. Um, you'll also note we're proposing, um, right now, you have, through a conditional use process, you can go up to four stories and 45 feet today in the urban code. We want to take a look at reducing that. We heard a lot of community feedback that four stories would be too much for the neighborhood. So we want to reflect that. Um, this is that test site for the smaller site. So this is similar to um, you know, some of the context that's out there today. Uh, a nicely placed house on a, on a lot with the uh, parking in the front. And then we test, you know, okay, can you foot, fit an accessory dwelling unit on that site? And the answer is not very big one, and it's, it's, it's a tight squeeze, right? So that's why we are recommending that future building come up to the street just a little bit more. It allows for the accessory dwelling unit because that could have a garage and a unit above, or it could just be one story, um, just depending on what the, you know, an individual would want to build. Uh, we're proposing a build to zone. So again, you have some flexibility on where that house is sited within that front, but that means you can go back as far as 20 feet or you can come as close as 10 feet. And in this scenario, we illustrated if there was a street improvement for on-street parking, you know, what that does to the street. Uh, and then this is another illustration if there's an opportunity for an alley in this site, what that does to the site as well. It, you're able to move the car to the rear. So. Again, that's just a, those are examples, illustrative examples of what a house could look like on the site, how the existing fabric fits in with what's a proposed um, fabric. We also are adding, um, and there's some of this already in the code. We want to go ahead, though, and illustrate it and make sure that it's really um, clear. Um, a frontage types. A frontage type is the front of a building, right? That's, that's a term that us planners have put onto uh, what most people would just call the front. And the front of the building would um, be required to have one of these frontage types, right? So porches and stoops are very consistent with the neighborhood. Um, but we also are illustrating shop fronts. You, you have some shop fronts today, a forecourt, an arcade or gallery, and a bracketed balcony. But those things are only appropriate in certain contexts, right? So when you're inside the single family duplex area, if you're building new construction, you would want, you're required to provide either a porch or a stoop. You can build a cottage, or you can, and I'll, actually, I'll go back to that in just a second. Yeah. We also introduced building types, and these are, again, illustrative, um, and then as far as their graphics go, but they also provide some regulatory uh, explanations onto what is permitted. So again, in the single family duplex, you're permitted to build a cottage, a duplex, a cottage court, and they, could all, they would all be required to either have a porch or a stoop. Um, inside, the, if there was a townhouse opportunity, a porch, stoop, or a bracketed balcony. An apartment house, that's the name that we're giving to a small uh, multifamily unit. A courtyard house, which could have um, a public function, or it could be a... a Again, a small multifamily building, or there's opportunities for live work once you get into the areas that have permitted uh, commercial uses, right? And these are some illustrations of what those uh, building types would be like. These ones with the photos, you know, we're actually, this is a work in progress, so we're still fine tuning those illustrative examples because we want to make sure that those are. Um, examples that are inspiring and, and speak to the East Stewart uh, context and the neighborhood and that aren't uh, foreign. Um, and that brings me to the end of the presentation. 
Um, again, we are, this is no actions being made today. The point was to get feedback. We've already received a lot of really good input and we will go back to the drawing board and sharpen our pencils on some of those districts and the permitted uses. Um, but I'm here to address any questions you may have and I really appreciate you taking the time to come. Um, and that's it. Yes, Mr. Brinkley. No, 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 no. Without, without. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Yeah, very good. <laughs> yes, that's exactly right. So we will, um, at the CRB, we will have a full draft of the proposed code. So, um, and we'll get that out um, probably a few weeks prior so that there's some time for folks who want to go through it and really read line by line. Um, we want to make sure that's available. Um, and we'll have another presentation with more detail. Um, and like I said, the sharpened pencil on some of these items that have come up already. So yeah. You know, they would provide a, some direction on whether or not they would recommend us to keep going or if we need to go back to the drawing board. <laughs> so, um, you know, it, so that's, that's uh, just another, again, another place for input. After that, let's say, you know, all goes well and they recommend that we continue with, you know, comments, you know, X, Y, Z, um, then we would go to the LPA, do a similar presentation, reflect back any changes that were requested. And then again, same thing with the LPA. If, they, if, it's, if it's okay, if it's in no comments, or if there's minor comments, we'll go forward to the city commission. And then again to the city commission. And then this would be approved after all those steps? After all those steps, the last one would be the adoption, yes. So could we get notified for the community redevelopment date Absolutely. So we'll, it'll go out. I mean, we can arrange to have it go out on a similar flyer, probably. That were, um, if the, the flyers have been good, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes, Mr. Bell. So there's a few places where um, we're considering it. So w one point you bring up, and I'll just reiterate for the group, is that when you come to an intersection, you know, there, there may be a bulb out for a plant. That bulb out area is not taking up the space of a potential car because, because of sight lines, you know, if you're, you're sitting in your car and you need to see the pedestrians, you know, a car, another car is the worst thing to be in your way, right? So you don't want a car there, right? <laughs> But there, are, there may be some places where there are bulb outs in, in other conditions. Um, there are other roads where, um, we, as part of the code recommendations, we're illustrating, and, and I'll be happy to share it with anybody. I don't have any slides on it, but um, they'll, we'll include it in some of the future presentations. Um, what is like a menu of roadway improvements that are there for discussion. So they're there for the community to digest, for the city and, and businesses to have a dialogue on. Um, because 
There are some places where there might be opportunity for more on-street parking on other roadways. So that's one, one piece of the puzzle that we've been investigating. Um, the other piece of the puzzle is I know that the MLK streetscape project is still in a design phase, and so we don't know what the net gain will be yet or, or you know, the final configuration of that. So that's still in flux. So that's something to just continue to, to think about. Um, you know, as far as removing bulb outs for parking, you know, there may be a handful of opportunities to do that, but what you, I, I would can caution against the cost benefit analysis of that, you know, where would an infrastructure project like that be better spent in improving another thoroughfare so that it has more on street parking versus removing an opportunity for shade trees in a, you know, a more pleasant, sidewalk environment, so, yeah. Well, and if, and if all, you know, if, if the housing that we all need and East Stewart neighborhood needs comes on board, it'll become more and more <laughs> something that, that everyone's gonna wanna talk about is how, how are all those parking needs being met. So to that point, we, we're not making any recommended changes to um, what already is required parking for residential in, in the neighborhood, so when you talk about, um, you know, if on a larger parcel some multifamily came in, they would be required to provide the one parking space per dwelling unit, which they're required to today. We don't want to change that, so that's part of the context. Yes, Helen. Well, these are the 2002 Charette. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it, this was the 2002 Charette uh, drawings for East Stewart. <laughs> I'll take them out. I'll take them out. <laughs> We're getting our eyes open. We're working on it. <laughs> yes, Mr. Franklin. <laughs> Show us on paper what, what really, and wordings and wording what's on that paper, because I can tell you anything, but if I don't show you my word, it don't mean nothing. I, I would like to see it exactly, because later you can say, well, y'all agreed to this here. Well, and, and, 
I, I agree with you, and I'm, I'm hoping that I'm getting there. Um, and, and that um, this code update, one of the big advantages of the way we're structuring this is it's not just words, it's pictures, it's diagrams, it's, um, you know, it, it's charts. Uh, words are not fun to read. I'd rather look at pictures and, and um, charts because too much can get lost in, in, in interpretation sometimes. Right. But it's also important to know what the words say. Right. So we're, we're going to say it with words, we're going to show it in a chart, and we're going to show it in a picture so that there's, you know, as much clarity and, and understanding as possible. I mean, that's, that's just the way to go forward on, on codes whenever we can. I can tell you that um, the city manager is working on that. There's a sidewalk on both sides of the road. He's having a design done to remove the sidewalk from one side so that we can widen the path and, and make some corrections there and get some of those flexible poles down. When he drove through it, he said he accidentally almost drove out onto the sidewalk because he thought it was the travel lane for his car. <laughs> Right, but we're we are aware of it, and there's a site visit, and he's getting it, and he's addressing it. Just so you know. Yeah, yeah that is, that's the truth. I, I was very excited to see that a sidewalk, at least, because that is a school crossing spot. So I don't know, but but maybe not as it has been built, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I know, and I watch how they cross. They've got been crossing, but their sidewalk is an ice can way to Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was is probably a misbalance yeah, there. They know how to cross now. They kept crossing that road. So I have a question. Um, this is a heavily pink area. Yes. So the way this map is laid out, it can be if there's homes there, can someone say, Oh, I'm gonna buy this home and then tear it down and build their heavy pink, you know, bar or a pipe of wood? So again, we're going to go in our time machines, right? That's what somebody can do today, right? So going forward, um, right now in that, that the pink, right, the building mixed use area, we are not proposing a change to that permitted use, right? But what we are proposing is that if there's one next door, to, if they, if they you know, want to rebuild brand new, they could be rebuild brand new. If they want to do an addition to that single family home, they can add to that. And now they don't have to go through a variance process to do that. It would be as of right that they could have a single family house there. So, um, so to clear, you know, again, to just reiterate this code recommendation or this code update, at least on this draft, we were not looking at removing any of those permitted uses, but adding more residential options. So, um, I, and we've heard loud and clear that the, you know, some of that, especially in the area that's green, you know, we want to revisit um, the pink. We want to, I, I think there's still some, there's a lot more commercial there, so we want to be a little bit more careful there about, you know, not striking anything that's already a permitted use and is an active use. Do you have a specific concern or? Right, right. So um, one of the things that we're, we've already proposed in this code is that right now there's an option to go up to four stories. Um, it, it's not, a, it's a conditional use aspect, but that four story height is, is too much for the neighborhood, is what we've heard. So we wanna make, we're gonna lower that in our recommendations. Um, so it would be less 
big, right? Um, we also want to really clarify that we went through the time to talk about those frontage requirements because, you know, let's say on land that's already vacant, right? Somebody goes ahead and they do want to build something that's, you know, multiple units or, or it has some sort of commercial function, um, that it meets the street in a way that is contextual. So that's, that's one of the protections against a monstrosity or a spaceship landing there, right? Um, you know, because some of those uses, they're nice to have in your neighborhood, but you, they need to then be good neighbors in their form and their operations and so on. So that's a multi-pronged issue sometimes with code enforcement and ordinances on sound and things like that. So that those are there as well. Right, and, and anything that's big would still go through. Um, that's the other thing, and, and we'll, I'll go over that in more detail too with the next presentation, is that um, conditional uses, so those are uses that you can't do as of right, they would go before um, you know, the, the various boards, depending on what it is, to get the approval. Um, and then there's also, you know, certain major site plan approval processes, right? So if you have a certain number of units, you know, you would have to go before the boards and, and explain what it is you want to do. And they would say, you know, no way, and, and have their, their process for going through that and evaluating it. And that is all still intact. Um, and, and recommended in the code. And in fact, we want to add some um, additional layers. You know, um, East Stewart, like a lot of neighborhoods, has, um, you know, uh, housing uh, neighborhood groups, you know, right? So we have ACES, we have the Concerned Citizens for East Stewart. Um, we would like, when, when projects are required to hit that threshold of uh, a major conditional use or a major project, that then they are required to host a meeting with the neighborhood, you know, and, and you know, we're not going to see it, CRB, until you guys go to the neighborhood and explain what you want to do. So that's another piece of the recommendations that, again, we'll talk about, I want to kind of detail in more, more specifics at our next um, presentation. We go before the CRB about that process. Um, so we wanted to add an, another piece to that, because East Stewart does have, um, you know, active community groups. Are you talking about Palm Beach Road and Martin Luther King? Yes. Yeah. What code were they able to get built? They're not in East Stewart. They were they they were considered just in the B2 code. They came in with a conditional use, and if you remember there was public hearings, they were gonna do duplexes on them, and then they brought them down to just straight zoning for single family residential. And East Stewart doesn't have a minimum lot width or lot size. So if you're in the East Stewart District, you can build a single family home on any size lot. So they would easily have been qualified under the East Stewart category, but they actually had to be held to a higher uh, level of scrutiny in order to be built because they had to have minimum lot widths. But they were just brought to their 50 foot wide original right. platted right. lots. Yeah, That's but they were straight zoning, platted. right. Yeah. Yesterday was built on East Stewart, but they are in East Stewart. Well, uh, the Eve Stewart overlay zone is adopted by the 2003 zoning. I agree with you. They're, the, the community of East Stewart, they're in. Mm -hmm. But the overlay zone did not include that vacant land, so they had to come before the commission and they had to have a higher scrutiny to them, and they were limited to the single family homes instead of the duplexes and the other stuff they wanted to do. Oh, so that, that's what I would say that I, I can't tell you what it's going to be yet. I got to do my homework, right? <laughs> and so um, we're going to do our homework. We're going to sharpen our pencil. And at that meeting, we'll come back with what the recommend, updated recommendations. No, this wouldn't come back until the fall. 
So we have to do our due diligence and make sure that, like I said, if, if we're gonna make a change like that, we have to make sure that the, that the city's protected and that there isn't somebody out there. I mean, I, I'll, I believe you, Mr. Bell, but I still have to do my homework and make sure that there isn't, you know, a veterinary office somewhere over there. I don't know. <laughs> now, what about pharmacists and drug dispensers? Do we have that now? Uh, that's a good question. I don't think that's permitted everywhere. I don't believe that pharmacies are a permitted use today in East Stewart. Okay. Is there some way you can find that list on, online where we can go? So if you want to look at the existing code today, the website you want to go to is called MuniCode. Yeah. I love this. I got some, some planners in the room. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's M U N I code. And you're going to, if you put into Google Muni code, Stewart, land development regulations, and if you want me to walk you through if you put, if you put where in, it is. If you search Muni code in one word, M U N I C O D E, yeah. Stewart. Stewart, Florida, it'll, it'll come, come up. up. And you don't have to limit it to land development. You don't have to limit it to code. You don't have to limit it to comp plan. If you write the word East Stewart yes. in the search bar, Every time the up. East Stewart Overlay Zone is referenced, will be highlighted in yeah. the search bar of Municode. Right. I, I, if you if you want, I'd be happy to walk you through it. You know, you can come to our office, and I'll I'll show you. It's it's not complicated, right but it's not obvious either. So. Not yet, because Uh-oh. I'm working on it. <laughs> it hasn't been written. <laughs> uh, yeah. So. Exactly. So that's why I want, at the, at the, when we come back in the fall, that's when I will be ready to show a, a full draft so it can be really scrutinized, apples to apples, um, and, and that will have the full breadth of the recommendations. Ms. Seymour, do you have your slides that you can email them to anybody who wants to look at it again? Absolutely, yes. If you want to email me directly, and also Pinal will have them uh, on hand, and we can, we can figure out how to distribute them. And I think Miss Miss um, James had said the door knockers work and the flyers. Is there anything else that we can do to get participation so that? Yeah, some people say they want to go to and they didn't yeah. get one. I don't know what kind of list you have. I know I send out emails just to people that I know. Um, I And then if you've provided an email address, too, I know that not everybody uses email, but we that went out on MailChimp. We've used that before. So. Well, thank you again for spending your afternoon here. Good evening.